The radiation blinded Bard is insensible both to the visual temptation of the aliens based on their resemblance to familiar figures of childhood and also to their sinister hue, which both repeats, suggests, and belies those green hills to which the travelers yearn one day to return one last time. Now, why do I go into such detail here? Because this experience, listening to the radio version of the Green Hills of Earth, confronted me with a problem that ever since has accompanied much of the work I've done and continue to do, and which I'll call in a phrase that I'm not very satisfied with, that of the visibility of the invisible. Listening to the radio in that darkened bedroom, my sister and I were seized by an impression, a feeling that seemed to us to be more vivid than anything we could see during the day, with our own two eyes, as it were. And yet, it was something that we couldn't really see at all. And precisely this invisible quality contributed, seemed to contribute to the force of the experience. Later, I was to learn that this was a problem quite familiar to philosophers and aestheticians, and that it was generally associated with words such as fantasy and imagination. For instance, what Kant calls productive as distinct from reproductive imagination. That is, which does not merely reproduce what one sees or is seen, but which produces things that were never and perhaps could never be seen. But I never felt quite satisfied that such concepts even came close to accounting for the strange capacity of these invisible images, if we can call them that, to produce extremely intense feelings, which, wh whose intensity seemed, in fact, to be in direct proportion to their indistinct and relatively indeterminate, non-objective quality. When several years later, television began to appear in the homes of a few friends, and we all gathered around minuscule screens covered with a thick magnifying glass to view many of the same serials that I had listened to for so many years on the radio, the shock was so strong that it actually gave me a, it made me give up listening altogether, much less viewing such programs. Upon viewing the masked rider truly visible with his mask on his white horse, accompanied by his tanto, I remember feeling a sensation of disgust at what seemed to me at the time, or at least now when I recall it in memory, to be an incredible heaviness of the images that were now rendered visible on that tiny magnified TV screen. The bodies of these figures seem weighted down with their own visibility by comparison with the ethereally vivid but invisible figures that had emanated for so many years from that tiny yellow radio bulb in the night. When many years later, I began to be concerned with how literary texts function. The question that I'd first encountered as a child listening to radio plays came back, but in a somewhat different form. This time, it was not in the darkness of the bedroom at home, but in the chiaroscuro lighting of libraries, offices, and wherever else I happened to read or study literary texts. For I found that something similar, although not identical, seemed to happen while I was reading those texts. A sense of vividness that seemed often to be in direct proportion to the indeterminacy, or at least vague visuality, of literary images. As an undergraduate student, I'll never forget the indignation of one of my professors of American literature at the way in which Poe described the main gallery of the House of Usher. This is a second longer quote on your, on your sheet. The room in which I found myself was very large and lofty. The windows were long, narrow, and pointed, and at so vast a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within. Feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellised panes and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around. The eye, however, struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. Dark draperies hung upon the walls, 
The general furniture was profuse, comfortless, antique, and tattered. Many books and musical instruments lay scattered about, but failed to give any vitality to the scene. I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow, an air of stern, deep, and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all. Now, it was in response to this passage that the professor seemed extremely agitated and irate. It won't diagram, I remember him saying, although today I can't for the life of me remember or figure out just how or why he should have wanted this particular description to diagram. Poe's point expressed explicitly in his philosophy of composition and clearly put into practice in such pra passages was that the effective value of such ostensibly descriptive passages had really nothing to do with their exactitude with respect to actually visualizable scenes. Moreover, in the passage quoted, one of the points was precisely to describe a space that confounded the eye's ability to see. Despite the encrimsoned light making its way through the stained glass windows into the room, the eye struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling. The scene was described as lacking not just in unity, coherence, and transparency, but also in vitality. It was therefore not a scene to be seen, but to be breathed as, uh, to be breathed as sorrow. I felt that I breathed an atmosphere of sorrow. But it is not the breath of life that characterizes this atmosphere, a word that occurs as the narrator first arrives at the house of Usher, which he describes from the outside as follows, quote three on your sheet. About the whole mansion and domain, there hung an atmosphere peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity, an atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven but which had reeked up from the decayed trees and the gray wall and the silent tarn, a pestilent and mystic vapor, dull, sluggish, faintly discernible and leaden-hued. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building. Its principal feature seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity. The discoloration of ages had been great. Minute fungi overspread the whole exterior, hanging in a fine tangled webwork from the eaves. Yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation. No portion of the masonry had fallen, and there appeared to be a wild inconsistency between its still perfect adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones. In this, there was much that reminded me of the specious totality of old woodwork, which has rotted for long years in some neglected vault with no disturbance from the breath of the external air. Beyond this indication of extensive decay, however, the fabric gave little token of instability. Perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure, which, extending from the roof of the building in front, made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn. The mention of atmosphere in this passage, redefines the description and its imagistic quality. These are no longer simply the representations of defined objects, as one might expect from a more or less traditional visual image, but rather they entail something more like a relational network that includes both subjects and objects. The spectator, observer, narrator, no less than the house itself and its inhabitants.